Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, if you're on the live stream, I apologize. I'm going to be speaking rather loudly today. We, uh, I guess something has happened to the PA. So today uh, we will be without uh, any sort of amplification uh, of the pastor. So I'm wearing a li the live stream microphone uh, to you guys. I'm going to be quite loud today, so you might have to uh, adjust your volume on whatever you're watching. Uh, but I would like to draw your attention to some of the announcements before the service begins. Uh, the first is that coming up next week, a week from tomorrow, uh, we are going to have an experimental, uh, hopefully a good time, a toddler and young child vacation Bible school. Uh, this will be next Monday here uh, from 3 to 5. We'll, we'll end with, with supper, but we're going to have Bible lessons, singing, crafts, some, some playtime. Uh, so parents of children from, from zero up to, to preschool age, if you're interested, uh, please join us next Monday from 3 to 5. Uh, also next week for confirmation parents, we are going to have an information meeting. That will be over at Grace next Wednesday the 17th. That will be at 6.30 in the evening. We'll go over the, the schedule and the expectations for this year. Uh, so parents and grandparents, are uh, welcome to attend that. That will be over at Grace. Uh, we are now in August, so you'll see on the back of the bulletin uh, that we are raising money to help cover the deductible of the approximately $13,000 that it's going to take to repair this roof, uh, then also the parsonage and the garage. Uh, we have received some, some gifts already, so thank you very much for those who have donated towards that. Uh, but we will accepting don no donations toward that throughout the month of August. Uh, there are also a couple notes here that we are uh, starting to fill out positions for our bell and liturgical choirs. Uh, if you are interested in, in bell ringing or, or in singing as part of the liturgy, uh, please do see faith if you are interested in that. Our opening hymn this morning is hymn 663. Hymn 663.
This morning we follow divine service setting three. I invite you to stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Psalm 26. My foot stands on level ground. In the great assembly, I will bless the Lord. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity, and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Prove me, O Lord, and try me. Test my heart and my mind. For your steadfast love is before my eyes, and I walk in your faithfulness. I do not sit with men of falsehood, nor do I consort with hypocrites. I hate the assembly of evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. I wash my hands in innocence and go around your altar, O Lord, proclaiming thanksgiving aloud and telling all your wondrous deeds. O oh Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Do not sweep my soul away with sinners, nor my life with bloodthirsty men, in whose hands are evil devices and whose right hands are full of bribes. But as for me, I shall walk in my integrity. Redeem me and be gracious to me. My foot stands on level ground. In the great assembly, I will bless the Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. My foot stands on level ground. In the great assembly, I will bless the Lord.
who cannot do anything that is good without you may be enabled by you to live according to your will. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated as we continue with the readings. The Old Testament reading for the eighth Sunday after Trinity is from Jeremiah chapter 23. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Do not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you, filling you with vain hopes. They speak visions of their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. They say continually to those who despise the word of the Lord, it shall be well with you. And to everyone who stubbornly follows his own heart, they say, no disaster will shall come upon you. For who among them has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see and to hear his word? Or who has paid attention to his word and listened? Behold, the storm of the Lord, wrath has gone forth, a whirling tempest. It will burst upon the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has executed and accomplished the intents of his heart. In the latter days, you will understand it clearly. I did not send the prophets yet they ran. I did not speak to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel, then they would have proclaimed my words to my people, and they would have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their deeds. Am I a God at hand, declares the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord. Do I not fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord. I have heard what the prophets have said, who prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long shall there be lies in the heart of the prophet who prophesy lies? and who prophesy the deceit of their own heart, who think to make my people forget my name by their dreams that they tell one another, even as their fathers forgot my name for Baal. Let the prophet who has a dream tell the dream, but let him who has my word speak my word faithfully. What has straw in common with wheat? declares the Lord. Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle is from Romans chapter 8. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The 
The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the seventh chapter. Glory be to thee, O Lord. Jesus said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So, every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruit. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. Let us together confess our faith as Christians using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated as we continue with the hymn of the day, hymn 745.
try the sermon from up here, even without the microphone, because uh, well, part of the reason why the pulpit is raised is theological, but also partly because hopefully sound travels all the way back from up here. Does it, for those of you in the back row? Good. We'll give this a shot. I apologize for whatever uh, monkey business is going on there. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text this Sunday, the eighth Sunday after Trinity, is our gospel reading, Matthew chapter 7. In the formula of Concord, which is part of the book of Concord, the collection of teachings that marks us as a Lutheran church, it says, We believe, teach, and confess that the only rule and norm according to which all teachings, together with all teachers, should be evaluated and judged are the prophetic and apostolic scriptures of the Old and New Testament alone. For it is written, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. This means that the only source of our teaching and the basis for our practice as a congregation and individuals is the Bible. The Bible alone is the inspired and inerrant word of God. Everything else gets measured against it. It doesn't matter who teaches something or how long it has been believed. Everything gets measured judged by the Holy Scriptures. Our Lord also invites us to think this way in the text this week. As his Sermon on the Mount drew to a close, he warned his hearers lest they should fall away into new and different doctrines than what they had heard from him. Jesus knew that many would come claiming to teach in his name, but who brought a new doctrine. Therefore, he warns us in the text to beware of false prophets who come to us with a different teaching and different works than what we have received from Christ. The way that we know them, he says, is by their fruits. We pray this week that the Lord and God would grant us a right discernment in all things, and preserve us in the true faith and to life everlasting. Beware of false prophets, Jesus said, who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. This is a difficult text and a difficult topic. But it is an important one to talk about. If we don't, we could end up like those in Jerusalem who did not receive God's word through Jeremiah. With our city and our temple destroyed and in captivity. Beware of false prophets, Jesus says. Now when we think about a false prophet, what is it or who is it that we think of? What sort of things does he say? When we think about a false prophet, we might think about someone who obviously teaches something contrary to God's word. There are people out there, say on the, the TV or the internet or on the radio, who we can point to and say that they are not teaching what is true. That it does not line up to what God says. And we praise and thank God that he has enlightened us to this extent. But it doesn't get to the root that Jesus is swinging at. A false prophet is someone who presents himself and wants to be known as a Christian pastor or teacher. 
who claims that his teaching is true according to the word, who yet teaches something different. This is what makes them so dangerous that our Lord warns us about them. When Jesus says that we will recognize them by their fruit, he does not necessarily mean their lifestyle. In fact, most, if not all, false prophets appear as upstanding Christian people. They are regularly in worship. They appear outwardly to be living faithfully. The fruit of a prophet is what prophecies he utters. And the fruit of a teacher is his teaching. False prophets are false because what they teach is false. It does not match up to Scripture. When you take the teachings they espouse and the actions they encourage, they do not match when held up to the light. The Apostle John wrote his epistles and his gospel in part to combat the teachings of a group called the Gnostics. These people claim that although Jesus was God, he did not have flesh and blood like we do. He did not become incarnate of the Virgin Mary, they said. St. John wrote, I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. Jesus is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. What St. John did was hold the word up to his hearers and show that what the Gnostics taught, who wished to be known as Christian teachers, did not match with what God had revealed. St. John was an eyewitness of Jesus, of course, but he didn't want his hearers to rely on that, but on the written word. St. Peter did the same in his letter. Although he was a witness of Christ's transfiguration, the word is more sure, he said. So also do we recognize a false prophet by measuring his teaching against God's word. But why are false prophets bad? Why make this distinction between true and false? It would be simpler, it would be easier, and outwardly more peaceful if we did it. Well, it's actually our Lord that makes this distinction. We heard it in the text. We simply follow. False prophets are bad because false teaching is bad. And false teaching is bad because, as our Lord said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Not every teaching is equally valid, nor is every passage of Scripture open to interpretation. Not everybody who claims to follow and teach Jesus' word will enter the kingdom of heaven, but those who hold to the true teaching, which is, that we are saved entirely by God's good favor through faith in Christ's perfect life and sacrificial death for us. False teaching, whatever it might be, seeks to chip away at that foundation and rob us of our salvation. False teaching is also bad because it is corrosive and contagious. 
once a piece of false teaching bores its way into our hearts, it's easy for it to spread to other areas of faith and even to other people. In the New Testament, the Sadducees were a leading group of the people, and they denied that anything miraculous exists, and therefore they refused to believe in the resurrection of the dead or even heaven. Among Christians today, there are some who deny the bodily resurrection, and therefore they deny the true scriptural teaching concerning heaven and the new creation. Some deny that God is the creator of every single human life, and that each individual is made in his image and with dignity that should be preserved and protected. And therefore, they may be ambivalent when an unwanted life is ended. False teaching in one area might spread to another and to other people. That's what makes it dangerous, but that does not mean that it can't be forgiven. Among the number of the apostles, there were two Simons. One was the Simon that we would know better as Peter, but the other was called Simon the Zealot. And the Zealots were a radical Jewish group that believed they needed to overthrow the Romans with violence if necessary. They combined their politics and their faith in such a way that they fell into a false understanding of God's kingdom. Jesus did not hold that against Simon, but forgave him. He called him to be an apostle to leave behind what was false and to hold on to what is good. And Simon did. He became a faithful preacher and teacher. Although tradition is divided on where exactly he went, it all agrees that he traveled far and labored tirelessly for the sake of the true gospel. The same Lord who forgave Simon also freely forgives us. It is possible that we have absorbed something that is not true by accident or unknowingly, and the Lord does not hold that against us. But there is also the possibility that we have taken to ourselves intentionally a teaching that, when measured, does not match the Scriptures. The Lord also forgives us that sin, and he invites us to leave it behind, and walk in the way of truth. How then do we do that? How do we walk in the way of truth and beware of false prophets? First, we should be aware that such things do exist. Not everyone who claims to teach the truth does. Not all who claim to come in the name of the Lord actually do. They might appear to, but we should be aware that not everything that sounds good is. And the way that we know is by measuring every teaching and practice according to God's word. Now, this does not mean that we need to be inquisitors and not believe anything until we have measured it. But it does mean that when we encounter a teaching or practice that is new or that seems strange to us, that we check and see what the scriptures might say about it. This means also that we have to pay attention to what we take in. We should listen to the sermon, especially if we are in a new setting or hearing a preacher with whom we are unfamiliar We should be like a good conductor who listens to ensure that each instrument in the orchestra plays in tune, in harmony, and in sync with the whole. So too should all our teaching and practice sound in harmony and in step with the scriptures. And lastly, 
another way that we watch out for false prophets is that we devote ourselves to true teaching by reading God's word directly and by learning from teachers who are proven to be faithful to the text. By the word, the Lord, the Lord grants us his Holy Spirit. And the Spirit's work is to create faith in our hearts and preserve us in the truth. Through the word, he hardens us against them so that we are not, in the words of St. Paul, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. By God's grace, through his word, he preserves us in the true faith unto life everlasting. But until that time, we will continue to confess as Lutherans. We believe, teach, and confess that the only rule according to which all teachings, together with all teachers, should be evaluated and judged are the prophetic and apostolic scriptures of the Old and New Testament alone. In this way, we observe our Lord's instruction and receive his gracious care and preservation. May the Lord grant this unto us all. Amen. Now the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing the offertory. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That God would root out all sins and vice, strife, disbelief, error, and heresy from us, and that he would rebuke the erring, convert the unbelieving, and bring the rebellious again to the unity of the Christian church, showing them the light of his truth. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That God would protect our shepherd from all danger of body and soul, and that he would bless all pastors, together with those who assist in building up the congregation and make their labors fruitful. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For parents and children, that they would be given the courage to love as God has loved us and be united in their common life by the Holy Spirit to know Jesus and serve him, and that the Lord would bless the single with chastity, protect the orphan, and defend the helpless. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all governing authorities, that they would fear God and serve to foster and preserve peace for our people and our country, that God would look favorably on them, and for our youth, that they would be brought up in the discipline and in right knowledge of Christ to recognize God's law and the way of salvation through him alone. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who need healing, strength, 
or comfort, especially the shut-ins of our congregation and those whom we name in our hearts. That they would be defended from the attacks of the evil one and able to join in God's praise. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For a hunger and thirst for the life-giving food of the blessed sacrament, that God would keep unbelief and impenitence far from his table, and that he would unite us in the fellowship of the pure teaching of the apostles and prophets, so that we give no offense and bring no division, but eat and drink in faith for the forgiveness of sins in the unity of a true confession. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have brought us to the knowledge of your word. Graciously keep us steadfast in this knowledge unto death, that we may obtain eternal life. Send us pious pastors who will faithfully preach your word without offense or falsehood, and grant them long life. Defend us from all false teachings and frustrate those who pervert your word, who would come in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves, that your true church may be established among us always and be defended and preserved from such false teachers. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue with the service of the sacrament, beginning on page 194. that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you. Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who out of love for his fallen creation humbled himself by taking on the form of a servant, becoming obedient unto death, even death upon a cross. Risen from the dead, he has freed us from eternal death, and given us life everlasting. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Trespass against us, 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night on which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endureth forever. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you, and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord with 
are closing him in 585. 